So for more on a very well documented and a personal account of World War I and early naval aviation, I give you Jeffrey Versano. Um, just out of curiosity, uh, a show of hands, how many either flyers or former service people in the audience? Okay, so um, I think you'll recognize a lot of the, a lot of the terminology. Um, David Ingalls is, as was uh, uh, described here, uh, a very lucky fellow. Uh, from the time he was born until the time he died, he led an extraordinary life. He was a member of one of the most prominent families in Ohio. Um, he was more than just sort of related to the Tafts. Uh, President Taft was his uncle. And uh, later in his life, he was the campaign manager for Senator Bob Taft from Ohio when he ran against uh, Dwight Eisenhower in the, in the Republican primaries. Uh, in between, he served uh, both in this First World War. He was one of the first undersecretaries of the Navy for aeronautics during um, the presidency of Herbert Hoover, who he adored, both Hoover and Mrs. Hoover. And then he came back to, uh, in the Second World War and served in a variety of staff positions in the Pacific and ultimately retired as a rear admiral. Um, at that point, he was still only in his mid-40s. So he was a busy, busy fellow. In terms of the, the origins of this book, you know, I, I think anybody that puts one of these things together, there's a story to it. And this one was probably about 50 years in its incubation. Uh, probably goes back to when I was a kid and watched the planes uh, take off and land at Mitchell Field on Long Island. And then that evolved into uh, a more academic interest in the subject. And as a teenager, I went out and interviewed World War I flyers. Um, I noticed that one of the scheduled guests today is uh, Charles Biddle. Are you here at this point? Um, I interviewed his grandfather, um, who was a World War I ace almost 45 years ago. Um, Eventually, I met some of the people that were involved with the Yale unit. Um, one thing led to another, and, and this book uh, was the result. So let me tell you about uh, David Ingalls' story, because his story is really the story of early naval aviation. David went to St. Paul's as a uh, high school student in uh, the early teens. He was a remarkable schoolboy athlete, and this is going to play an important part in his success as a flyer. He had remarkable strength, endurance, agility, hand-eye coordination, sense of balance, and so forth. From there, um, having earned a reputation as a hockey player, he went on to Yale in the fall of 1916, where he met this fellow, Truby Davison. Truby Davison's father is, the, is Henry Pomeroy Davison, who is the managing partner at J.P. Morgan, who is also going to be the head of the wartime committee of the Red Cross uh, for the United States. And Truby, as part of the preparedness, preparedness movement, which was sweeping the Eastern colleges, had gone to Paris in the summer of 1915 to drive an ambulance. Uh, taking wounded soldiers from the train stations to the hospitals in Paris. But the more he did that, um, he looked around and there were these planes flying overhead and he met a number of flyers and he said, that's what I'd really like to do. So he went home and he spoke to his father and said, Dad, do you think you can maybe underwrite this? And the father said, sure, and if I can't, uh, well, I'll ask my friends uh, the Lovitz and the Harrimans and so forth, and the Rockefellers, there's one of them in the group as well. And in 1916, in the summer, a small group of, of young men uh, got together and began flight training. And their decision was they wanted to be naval flyers, and they were going to form a coastal patrol squadron. 1916, the fall of 1916, uh, David Ingalls arrives at Yale, he meets Truby. He meets Truby's younger brother, Harry. 
Uh, he is invited to join the group. He does. During that winter, the United States and Germany drift closer towards war. And in March, just before the United States declared war, uh, <coughs> Germany, um, the Yale unit, now about 24, 25, 26 young men, uh, marches down to New London in Connecticut where they enlist in the Navy um, as uh, seamen sixth class. I mean, they are uh, at, at the very bottom. And they are sent to Palm Beach. Uh, Palm Beach is where there is a, a flying school run by Rodman Wanamaker of the Wanamaker Philadelphia um, department store. And the Navy assigns one of their pioneer flyers, a fellow by the name of Eddie McDonald, to take charge of this, this group of college boys. And from the end of March until June of 1917, they begin their flight instruction. Uh, among the uh, members of the group, this first Yale group, is this fellow, Di Gates, a uh, football player. Uh, he becomes a, a base commander during the war, and during the Second World War, he will become the Navy's top civilian aeronautical uh, 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 civilian manager. He's the undersecretary of the Navy for aeronautics during the war. This is where they're staying at the, at the Salt Air Hotel. It is, it's no longer there now. Actually, this resent, represented quite a come down because at first they were staying at the Breakers in Palm Beach. <laughs> but it wasn't really convenient, uh, conveniently located to the flying operation, so they moved here. And this is the entire group taken uh, in Florida, the photograph, uh, probably in May of 1917. And by this time there are close to uh, 30 of them and you can see some of the aircraft uh, behind. Uh, they're launched via uh, ramps that take them from the land down into uh, basically uh, Lake Worth uh, on these dollies or, or cradles. There's Eddie McDonald on the right. He was, um, he was hell on wheels. He, he really was. He uh, uh, was energetic. He was funny. He happened to have a Medal of Honor that he could wear around his neck when he wanted to impress people. He had gotten that for courage uh, under fire at Veracruz in 1914. Uh, he's the first Navy flyer to have one of those. Ground school did not exist as we are familiar with it today. In fact, the Navy at this point had a very small training facility at Pensacola. Uh, it, it was not at all what it uh, grew into very quickly. And they had not yet established the uh, ground school at MIT, which became, again, a very large, very structured, very academic type operation. So instead, these early groups uh, almost all of whom were college volunteers, uh, basically picked it up by the seat of their pants. Uh, McDonald would give lectures, they would play with engines, they would work at repairing their planes. Uh, McDonald, in a 1960 interview, uh, talked about how they used to hide behind various columns and struts and supports and boxes and try to take a nap when he was, he was giving his, his lectures. But apparently they learned enough because all of them uh, soloed uh, while they were down in Florida and became, uh, many of them, uh, very proficient and many of them went on to become instructors, which was, again, the way it worked. The first generation of flyers uh, was used to train the next generation and those that followed. Here was the machine that got them into the air. This is the Curtis F boat. It's a single engine pusher flying boat. Uh, you have a pilot and instructor seated side by side in the uh, cockpit in the forward part of the, uh, the airplane. Um, every one of these fellows who left a written record of their early flights, they were just enthralled. And anybody who's ever been up in a small, 
uh, open cockpit single engine uh, uh, plane probably knows exactly what they were talking about. And of course, they're from a generation that was not uh, rather jaded about climbing aboard a 747 and jetting off to, uh, to Paris. They had never done anything like this before, and they were ecstatic. Not terrible, terribly military looking. This is uh, morning uh, muster. Uh, they're kind of uh, mixed uh, uh, working clothes, uh, mixed haircuts, mixed posture, and so forth. As I say, uh, they were in the Navy, uh, but it was definitely not done in the uh, regimented way that was carried out at a at a Navy base. This was definitely a pickup operation. Now, as it got warmer in Florida, uh, more and more heat is baking up, uh, rising up off the land, off the water. The air becomes more unstable. These aircraft are not terribly stable. They will fall off. Um, uh, they'll, uh, they'll side slip, they'll fall off into a spin. Uh, these guys are not very experienced. And so the decision was made to move the base up to Huntington, Long Island. And this is a photograph uh, taken of the, the training operation in Huntington, New York. Um, the land you see on the top horizon there, if you just jumped over that, you would been, be in Long Island Sound. So if you're familiar with that at all. Um, here we have a number of F-boats, and at the, uh, all the way on the far right is an R-6, Curtis R-6, which is a, uh, I guess, an advanced uh, trainer. It's also used in the early days for some offshore patrol. This is the first Navy plane, by the way, to be looped. Um, a, a marine flyer named uh, Cocky Evans. Uh, was down in, uh, in Pensacola in 1916 and was flying one of these things and fell off into a spin. And everybody figured he was dead. And he actually figured out how to get out of that spin, for which he was eventually awarded the Distinguished uh, Flying Medal or Cross in the 1930s, uh, sort of retroactively for the act of figuring out how to get out of the spin. He said, well, I've done it once. I have to do it again. So he goes up to 3,500 feet, boom, does it again, does it again. Then he says, well, you know, they say you can't, you can't loop one of these things because of those uh, uh, big uh, floats on, on the, uh, underneath. And he takes it up, and, and for the first time, um, he was able to uh, loop one of these aircraft. Uh, here they are again. Uh, they, they've been in the Navy now for, let's see, March, April, May, June, about four months. So at least they, they can line up straight. Uh, <laughs> the, their toes are pretty much on the mark. But otherwise, they are still a pretty um, bedraggled uh, looking group. Um, here they are uh, launching uh, one of those um, R6s. And this is done, this is muscle power. That, that's all there is to it. It's, the plane is on a, a wheeled cradle, and just like you would launch a, uh, uh, launch a boat uh, on a uh, ship railroad, uh, it's the same operation, down into the water until it floats, and then you bring it back in, you position it on the cradle, and you, you pull it up um, out of the water. And this was done not only for small boats but like this, but for um, or small aircraft, but for aircraft as large as the uh, behemoth uh, patrol boats at the end of the war, which would be launched with a loaded weight of about 10,000 pounds. So um, not surprisingly, the crews that launched them were known as the beach mules. In late July and early August, a team of Navy officers came up to New York and the young Yale Flyers um, took their flight tests to, to gain their flying certificates, to be declared uh, naval aviators, and to qualify for their commissions as ensigns. Um, all of them did, except Truby Davison, who was the 
uh, the founder of the group. Um, he crashed his plane, broke his back, um, and was basically uh, on uh, injured reserve, if you will, uh, for the rest of the war, and actually suffered from that for the rest of his life. However, in the 1960s, on the 50th anniversary of the, um, the, the forming of the Yale unit, there was a reunion held, and the Navy awarded him his honorary gold wings. David Ingalls uh, qualified, and then they sent everyone home for uh, a few weeks of, uh, on leave. Uh, here he is on the steps of the family home overlooking uh, Lake Erie in uh, just outside of Cleveland. Everybody, of course, wanted to be sent overseas. Most of them in the beginning were not. They needed, they needed them as instructors, and so they were parceled out to one place or another. But he was one of a handful, about half a dozen, that were sent immediately overseas. He traveled on the St. Paul, which at that point was pretty much a rust bucket. I mean, if you think about this, we are seven, five years after the Titanic. Well, if you know of Mauritania and Aquitania and all those giant canard liners, and here we have the St. Paul from the 1880s. And when he first saw this, he remarked somewhat facetiously that he thought this was the launch to take them out to. <laughs> <laughs> These ships had to obviously pass through submarine infested waters. Uh, they all carried uh, Navy gun crews. Um, uh, Navy weapons were installed on the ships and there were uh, small gun crews usually um, three or four officers and about 25 or 30 men to handle three or four um, weapons. And as they would travel across, they would, they would do their practice uh, shooting and everything looked like a submarine. A, a box floating in the water, a porpoise, um, any sort of uh, white cap in, in the right uh, light situation. Uh, luckily for Ingalls and everyone on the ship, they never did come anywhere close to a submarine. And in October of that year, he landed in Liverpool. This was where, if you were going to England, this is where you, you were sent. Um, you would enter either through the northern or southern entrance to the Irish Sea, and on into Liverpool. He lands in Liverpool and, of course, immediately has to have a walking stick. You know, he, he talks about this in his diary. Everybody either had a walking stick or a swagger stick, you know, one of those things you, you put on, under your arm. Um, so far as I can tell, he never actually used this thing, but he wanted to buy it and he wanted to be photographed with it. From there, he went down to London. Now. The mention was made that he comes from rather affluent circumstances. His father and his grandfather on his father's side are in the railroad and banking business. On his mother's side, you have the Tafts, <coughs> and that money comes originally from the iron industry, um, the steel industry in Ohio. So there is lots of money here and he is not going to be staying at the YMCA. <laughs> so he stays at the Savoy, he stays at Claridge's, he stays at all of the uh, largest um, uh, hotels in London. He visits the theater uh, over and over and over again. Um, this is uh, Chu Chin Chow, which was a, uh, uh, a review with an oriental uh, theme that ran for, oh, I think, something like 1,500 appearances, which was an extraordinary thing for that period of time. Um, good restaurants, but eventually he has to get to work, and so he's sent to Paris, where, of course, he stays at more delightful hotels, goes to more extravagant uh, restaurants, the Café de Paris, and so on and so forth. 
he reports to this place. This is the only photograph of this I've ever seen. This is Navy, this is Navy headquarters in Paris at the uh, Hotel Jena. You can actually, probably not from here, but up there it says United States Navy. And this was where naval aviation was headquartered in Europe during World War II in this facility. Uh, this building is still here. Um, I mean, all of these buildings in downtown Paris are still here, but this one is, is still here in uh, uh, great shape. He reports to this fellow, Hutch Cohn. Hutch Cohn is one of the Navy's leading engineers. In fact, as a commander, he had been bumped up to uh, head the Department of Steam Engineering, which carried with it at least the temporary rank uh, of Admiral. Um, an early supporter of aviation, didn't fly, but became a very, very strong advocate of building up aviation forces in Europe uh, during the war. Our friend young Mr. Ingalls went to headquarters, got his orders, and was sent down to a place called Mushik. Mushik is located in southwestern France on the Bay of Biscay. There are a series of lakes just inland behind the dunes um, near the city of Bordeaux. Uh, one of them is Hortan, which is a um, uh, French base. You have Mouchique, which was turned into an American training station. You have Cazot, which is another French station where um, uh, gunnery was taught, and a lot of the early army flyers was sent there for gunnery training. This is the American station at Mushik, and here was time to learn another type of aircraft. This is the FBA, Franco-British Aviation uh, Company. And again, it is a flying boat, uh, a pusher, and it is equipped with a rotary engine. Rotary, en rotary engine, if you're not familiar with them, is one of the oddest contraptions ever invented. To spin the propeller, the entire engine spins. So the propeller is bolted to the crankcase, and the crankcase spins. Now, it works perfectly fine, and some of the most famous planes of the war use them, the Sopwith Camel, for example. But it has one inherent problem. By getting that heavy mass of metal spinning, you create an incredible amount of torque. And if you don't know what you're doing, it is very easy to have the plane literally whip over and go into a spin. The flyers here, the sort of neophytes, said, OK, if you make a right-hand turn, you could go into a spin and get killed. We'll only make left-hand turns. So if we have to go right, we will go 270 degrees left. Now, obviously, you couldn't do that in a, a combat situation, but it seemed to work for some of them in the, uh, the school situation. When David Ingalls was there, Mushik was being built, it literally was being created. Um, they had to cut down the forest, uh, level the ground, and, and start putting up hangars and barracks and so on and so forth. So what he experienced, again, was not going to be what most of the flyers who followed him experienced. What he saw was the bare beginnings of a training station. Uh, there he is reunited with Robert Lovett. Robert Lovett is um, another of the Yale unit. Uh, he had actually gone to Europe about two weeks ahead of Ingalls, three weeks ahead of Ingalls. He is the sort of wonder kid of naval aviation. He is given ever increasingly uh, complex problems to solve. He is remarkably, not only is he, he intelligent and hardworking, he is very organized. He's very insightful. Eventually, he's going to become the commander of the uh, night bombing units that the United States Navy tries to establish during World War I, the first Navy strategic bombing initiative. Uh, after the war, he's going to come home. He's going to marry 
uh, a Brown of Brown Brothers Harriman. He's going to make uh, quite a career for himself in investment banking. He's going to be called back to Washington by um, Secretary Stimson, and he is going to be the leading civilian official in charge of the strategic bombing campaign of World War II. He impresses George Marshall. George Marshall makes him Assistant Secretary of State, later Assistant Secretary of Defense, and he is the Secretary of Defense during the second half of the Korean War. Uh, he then retires when, when President Kennedy comes into office. He tells his officials, his transition team, you know, get, go get me Bob Lovett and give him any job he wants. Uh, he did not. He decided that he'd had a, a, enough career. Uh, by that time. Anyway, Lovett is going to become, in essence, Ingalls' patron. Because they are college mates, because they are part of the Yale unit, um, he is going to select Ingalls for, again, increasingly respons responsible duties. This is what's less of, left of Mushik today. The United States built about 30 stations in Europe during World War I. Two of them still have some substantial <coughs> physical presence. Uh, this one and uh, one a little further north, uh, saint georges That's the, uh, that was um, sort of bachelor officer's quarters uh, during the war. It was a small chateau and now is in quite decrepit conditions. And this is originally this was the uh, seawall, and so the water came right up against there. That is the only monument in France to uh, the Americans in the naval aviation that served over there. I'll tell a story anyway. My wife has heard it a million times, but I traveled over to France to look for these places. And I had the uh, French teacher in, in school uh, work out a series of uh, phrases that I could use to make myself understood. And I came across a, a group of people who were sitting on the beach not far from here. And in my, I thought, not bad French, introduced myself and said, I'm an American historian, I'm writing a book, and I'm looking for uh, this station, and you know, can you help me? And they looked at me, and they looked at me, and then one of them said, it would be a lot better if you said it in English. <laughs> Another of Engel's close associates in the war, in fact, in fact, his doppelganger, if you will, is Kenny McLeish. Kenny McLeish is the younger brother of the uh, poet, uh, librarian of Congress, um, Archibald McLeish. He is from Chicago, and the two of them basically train together. They train together and serve together uh, throughout the war. At the very end of the war, they switch uh, jobs, uh, each filling the, the other's position. Following his time in southern France, um, Ingalls, McLeish, and a third young uh, flyer named Shorty Smith, Edward Shorty Smith, are sent to Gosport, England, where there is a flying school having been developed by a British um, flyer named Robert Smith Barry. He invented or developed something called the Gosport tube. You see this fellow with the tube sticking out of his mouth? This allows him to actually speak to the fellow behind. Um, because of the noise in there, made it impossible for the trainee and the instructor uh, to communicate. These three Americans were sent here for advanced flight training because the Navy was establishing a patrol station at Dunkirk. Dunkirk was an exposed spot right on the northern border of, of France just before you got to Belgium. The uh, front lines were 15 miles away. It was under fire continually from artillery, from over-air bombardment, from uh, German vessels would come uh, zipping down the coast in the middle of the night, blast away, and then uh, go back north. And the United States was going to establish a patrol base there 
to go after submarines that were coming out of a complex of German submarine bases in Belgium, at Bruges, Zeebrugge, and Ostend. And these three Americans were going to be flight commanders. So in other words, they were going to have control over a flight of four or five aircraft uh, that were part of this mission. So they were sent to Gosport, and this is where they boarded in this uh, basically artillery fort. Uh, looks like a little castle with a moat and such. Uh, it, this is part of a whole series of forts that were built to protect Gosport and, um, and Portsmouth during the 1850s when there was a scare that war with France might be coming. There they were introduced to their first land plane. This is the Avro 504. There were thousands of these made. It was a very both gentle and responsive aircraft. It was an excellent aircraft to, to train with. And this was, this was their uh, first introduction to sort of a real airplane, because the handling characteristics of this are entirely different than one of these flying boats. These flying boats, if you got up to 80 miles an hour, uh, you were doing really, really well. Uh, this thing was, you know, up over 100, 105, 110, uh, much more maneuverable. You could do all kinds of tricks with it, and of course, they immediately did because the Gosport system was, you don't fly with an instructor after a while. We give you an airplane, now just go play. Go play, go practice, do, uh, uh, do dog fights with each other, um, which they did. They would also, they loved to go uh, racing along the ground at 25 or 30 feet above the ground. They would, you know, jump after, after herds of cows. They would head for a house and then pop up and over the house. They would just hellions. Uh, uh, driving people nuts in that area, but it did make you uh, a much better flyer. Well, some it made much better flyers. This is a picture that Ingalls took while he was at Gosport. Now, there weren't that many aircraft there. You know, two dozen or so, that were, and on any given day, six, eight, ten, the sky is a big place. You would think how is it possible that two planes could, these two, the actual story behind this is literally they were circling over the field and they ran into each other. Neither person was killed, luckily, but uh, the planes were pretty much done in. Now, this is what he graduated to. This was probably, um, this was definitely Ingalls favorite aircraft. This is the one that he made his reputation on. This is the famous uh, Sopwith Camel. Um, if any plane has an issue with torque and with the turning ability, this is it. Almost the entire weight of that airplane is compressed into an area of not much more than about six feet in the nose of that plane. The engine, the armament, the cockpit, the fuel tank, it's all there. It's got a powerful rotary engine. And the thing that made it so successful as a dogfighter is that literally it could turn like that. Just turn like that. It was an inherently unstable aircraft. Now, an inherently unstable aircraft is also a dangerous aircraft. And this was responsible for more training deaths than any other aircraft in the Allied armory. But it was a superb dogfighter. Even at the end of the war, when it was becoming obsolescent, a skilled pilot could still do an enormous amount of damage with one of these things. And Ingalls loved it. Everything in that sort of schoolboy athlete, that uh, uh, hockey player uh, that he had, had been at one time, he transferred to this machine. From Gosport, they went on to Turnberry. Uh, some of you may have watched the, uh, uh, the tournament from Turnberry a couple of years ago. In fact, the gunnery school that he attended is on the golf course where, was that the British Open? That the British Open was played on uh, a couple of years ago. It had been a golf course, it was turned into a, to a flight school, and then it was turned back into a golf course. This is where they studied really the science of gunnery. And then they moved on to air. 
which was, is also up in Scotland, also in the northwest of Scotland. The weather is horrendous. It is literally always raining. When we would travel uh, there in um, March, February and March, and you got the weather map of England, you would see um, rain, partial sun, a little of this, a little of this in southern England, and then in northern England across Scotland, it would always say gales gales and, and heavy rain. And that's what they were flying in. It was quite dangerous. And a number of people and a number of Americans uh, were killed. This is a monument to the Americans killed there in 1918. Here is another one of Ingalls' photographs. And here is a, a, a plane uh, that came down. As a matter of fact, things got so bad that the pilot cadets went on strike. They said, we're not going up in these aircraft anymore. And the commander, rather than ordering them, got his flight instructors and the two of, the, and the two of them, the group of them, went up in the camels and put them through the most violent acrobatics at extremely low levels, you know, defying all the rules against safe flying, and then brought the planes down and basically shamed them into getting back into the planes and, and, and going aloft. From air, it was on to Dunkirk. This is a little hand-sketched map that was made by the Navy officer that visited there in 1917 and selected uh, the site. The American base, well, This is the French base, flying base. Up that hangar there, that's the British. And right around the curve here is the American station. It is one of the worst possible places to put a seaplane base. It is a working naval harbor. It is a working merchant ship harbor. It is narrow and constricted. There are buoys and barges and cranes everywhere. There is a crosswind blowing acro across the, the land. Because you, when they, you would go to some place like Gosport, you have essentially a huge open field. You can take off or land in any direction. Here, because you're back on float planes, you can only take off and land in one direction. And if the wind is coming from the wrong direction, what are you going to do? Stay up there till you run out of gas? No, you're going to come down. And so there is a, there's a litany of, of, of planes literally running into ships, smashing into the seawall, and so forth. And again, there are several American deaths at the American station there. This is the only panorama I've ever found of Dunkirk. And you can see this narrow strip of water here that's where they were landing and taking off from. This is what Ingalls was flying. Uh, this is the Henriot DuPont. It's actually a land aircraft that was flown mostly by the Belgians and the Italians. Um, it was turned into a float plane by putting those um, uh, big floats on it. It was no match at all for what the Germans were flying in 1917 and 1918, which were uh, much more aerodynamically um, uh, proficient. Uh, in fact, by 1918, they're flying a, a, a single wing metal uh, skin uh, aircraft that can fly circles around these things. And this is where this is where Ingalls first got his uh, baptism in combat, is flying patrols in, in this aircraft. And again, you can see the, um, uh, the opposite shore of the canal there. Because the rise and fall of the tide in, in Dunkirk is so extreme, the planes were literally picked up and launched and retrieved with a crane, which made for some fairly slow operations. Uh, the commander was Godfrey Chevalier. There was a building named after him down at Pensacola. He was again one of the earliest of the naval flyers and died in a flying accident uh, in 1922. Here is the, um, the enlisted uh, crewman. This is the patrol plane. 
that when looking for the submarines carried the bombs and Ingalls would fly essentially escort for these machines. Again, very rare photograph of, of the um, aircraft lined up ready to go out on a patrol at Dunkirk. The middle plane, now you can't see it, but if you blow this thing up, 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 up on the computer, you can see the high forehead of Ken McLeish. So it's actually possible to identify the pilot of that, um, that middle aircraft. Uh, killing time is his a bomb proof because again you have a German aircraft coming over on an almost nightly basis trying to unload this thing you can actually there's a little blur just above the roof and that's the uh, the baseball and this is what they were trying to protect against this is a, a raid that took place in April or May of 1918 and this is just one of about 10 aircraft that were shredded by the explosion. This base was attacked at least 150 times up until July of 1918. The remarkable thing is not a single person was ever killed despite the amount of ordnance that was rained down on the base. March 1918. Germany unleashes its uh, offensive to try and end the war. Uh, the RAF, as it comes into existence on the 1st of April, uh, desperately short of pilots. The United States has extra pilots and not enough planes, and there's an, an arrangement made, and those three, McLeish, Ingalls, and Smith, are transferred from Dunkirk to 213 squadrons flying Sopwith Campbell's and off they go, and they spend the month of April flying with the British. Here we have 213's uh, camels lined up at the uh, Berg airfield. And here we see the, the three of them. There's Ingalls in the center with his pipe, always with his pipe, uh, Kenny McLeish on the right, and Shorty Smith, for obvious reasons, uh, on the left. They're standing in front of the, CIA, the CO's hut at the British field. After service with the British, he goes back to Dunkirk, spends another month at Dunkirk, then heads on down to Paris, check in to headquarters, has his uh, uh, portrait taken. He's in the middle. The fellow in the right is uh, John Skinny Lawrence. Now, that doesn't mean anything, except after the war, Ingalls' daughter is going to marry Lawrence's son, and their children are going to attend my school, where their names are on the, the boards for, you know, the captain of this team and the captain of that team. So the story kind of came uh, all around in, in a circle. From Paris, he was sent down to a place in central France, France clermont Front, where the army was running a bombing school. The Navy was planning a strategic bombing campaign against those German submarine facilities. They said trying to find a submarine during the day out in the North Sea is an absolute waste of time. You could find them at night because they have to be up on the surface at night to uh, recharge the batteries and so forth, but we can't find them at night. And who wants to land in Dunkirk Harbor at night? Instead, what we'll do is we will put together a force of heavy bombers and we will go and destroy the infrastructure. We will destroy the docks, we will destroy the sub pens, we will blow up the repair facilities and so forth. And if the submarines don't have any place to go home to, then that's the end of the problem with the submarines there. And so the Navy puts together this program. They ask for volunteers. Well, Ingalls has been flying that Henry O. DuPont now, back and forth over the ocean, you know, getting bored out of his skull, said, I'll do it. And so down he goes, and he now learns to fly bombing aircraft. 
where he meets up with this fellow. This is Randall Brown. This is his observer, gunner, bombardier, enlisted flyer. He's actually one of the people who was in that photo at Dunkirk of the uh, enlisted men in front of the patrol plane. And the two of them become an inseparable pair. And they go through their training there. Uh, here is, in fact, uh, uh, Brown's um, report card, if you will. But, you know, they list his, his pilot as Ingalls. Ingalls can't stand being at the Army School. Now, by this point, he has been in combat. He has flown a half a dozen or more types of aircraft, and he's got instructors who don't have anywhere near his experience, um, either technically or in real life, and they're trying to tell him how to fly an airplane. And he writes home to his parents complaining about all of that, but nonetheless uh, scores excellent marks. And then as part of the program, he and Brown and the other Americans are sent back to the British. The British are acting as their um, instructors. The Americans will fly British aircraft with a British unit for a certain number of raids, learn how to conduct them, and then go back to the building American um, units. So this is what they're flying, the DH-9, the de Havilland 9. Um, this thing was supposed to be an improvement on the DH-4, which was actually a pretty good uh, a light bomber observation kind of aircraft. Really very fast for its type. This was supposed to be an improvement. In fact, it was a lot worse. So you get this thing loaded, and you'd be doing, if you really strain, 75 miles an hour. Now, imagine being moving along at 75 miles an hour. On top of you, you have German fighters who just want to, you know, eat your lunch. And down on the ground, you have German uh, flak crews that are blasting away. And by the end of 1917, 1918, those crews are pretty darn good at bracketing an aircraft. Um, and so you would go out, and more often than not, that plane would come back with, with holes in it. Um, but anyway, that's what they were flying. He flew several ra uh, raids with the British. Here you see the arrangement. The, the gunner, the bombardier, sits right behind the pilot. So in fact, they can talk to each other. That was the improvement in the airplane. This is what they were going for. This is not World War II. This is a World War I submarine pen. Uh, this is at Zbrugge, which is on the coast of Belgium. This is one of three German submarine facilities that were built there uh, during the war. Here is Bruges. That is the German base. This is from an aerial reconnaissance uh, photo. You can actually, again, if you know, you, to get up close to that, you can pick out submarines and destroyers that are stationed there. This is the actual organization that Ingalls was going to be part of, the Northern Bombing Group, uh, this, this strategic bombing initiative. The man in the, the center, the officer in the center with the mustache, that's uh, Captain uh, David Hanrahan. He was actually a, uh, a destroyer captain and was also in charge of one of the American uh, Q ships during the war, one of those sort of camouflage uh, vessels, and then was given this job to run this, this bombing program. Knew nothing about aviation, knew nothing about flying, but he did have, you know, uh, substantial rank, and that enabled him to negotiate with sort of other uh, parts of the Navy bureaucracy. Anyway, this is probably taken on Armistice Day, where they, they took their, in essence, their yearbook photo, and everybody is in a, in a really good mood. This is where Ingalls was sent when he actually joined the Northern Bombing Group. This is St. Engelbert. This was, became a, uh, a base where uh, large bombers were located. Uh, Hanley Page uh, 400s were here. That doesn't mean anything to, except to say that plane has a wingspan of about a hundred and some odd feet. It's roughly the size in terms of dimensions. 
It's only a little smaller than a B-17. Now, it's not nearly as heavy, and it doesn't carry nearly the, uh, the bomb load, but uh, it could carry a ton of ordnance uh, over a fairly long distance. So, uh, a major piece of weaponry. But Ingalls is bored again because there's a shortage of planes. So he starts begging Bob Lovett to send him back to 13 Squadron. He joins these guys, joins the British, flying his Sopwith Camel. There's the uh, tight cockpit of it that he lived in. He was a big guy, I mean, he was over six feet. And so he really had to sort of squeeze himself in this thing. There are some of his, his flight mates, and it is with the British 213 Squadron that he shoots down uh, bits and parts and pieces of probably at least eight aircraft and balloons, uh, earning his uh, place as the Navy's first ace. That's what he was shooting for, full of hydrogen. This is where he went after he was with the British. He became the uh, flight officer there in charge of making sure that aircraft that were being sent to the Americans actually could fly. Um, he's part of the, the crew that worked with him. Is his enlisted crew. The fellow standing there uh, up above behind the, the propeller is in fact his, his bombardier from uh, his duty during the summer of 1918. Here's their armistice photos. And he goes home in December of 1918 aboard the uh, uh, Mauritania. He's at this point 19 years old. Here he is under secretary for aeronautics. At this point, he, he may have just hit 30. May have just hit 30. And here he doesn't look anywhere even close to that. Uh, He's out on the West Coast for um, a fleet and aviation exercises. As a flyer, this is one of the reasons that Hoover chose him, he test flew all the aircraft that the Navy, now he was not obviously the factory test pilot, but he flew all the aircraft that the Navy uh, uh, purchased, the types. Here he is uh, on board the, uh, uh, on board Langley, I think. And here he is uh, with the um, officers on board either the Lexington or the Saratoga. Uh, he's right seated right in the center in his, um, in his summer suit. And at that point, I think I'll, I'll cut off here. So now I'm bound to invite uh, if there are any questions or observations or anything at all, feel free. Yes, sir. What circumstances led you to interview when you were a young teenager, World War I pilots? I am not sure. You know, I, <laughs> no, I, I've, I've, you know, as I, as I sort of rehearse my, my remarks, I think about it, what was it after my first year of college that I said, I'm going to go out and do this. And I can't remember why. But I know I, I worked through the American Legion. I, I worked through some of the other veterans group and tracked down a lot of people. I mean, starting with Eddie Rickenbacker. I mean, interviewed in his office in, um, in New York City. Uh, Eastern Airlines, yeah. Well, he did, this is not Air, Eastern Airlines at that point. Yeah. yeah. Um, George Vaughan, who was an ace in the American and the British service. Um, I traveled all, all around the, the Northeast looking for these guys, and one of the ones that I mentioned was, was Charles Biddle, who became a group commander, and I interviewed him at his, his estate down uh, near Philadelphia. And that sort of, that was the bug there. And I then did work on it in graduate school. I wrote my master's thesis about this, published some articles. Uh, through my wife, met the uh, daughter of the fiance of Kenny McLeish and got to see his World War I letters. 
And that led to a book, and that led me to the Naval History Center at that time, uh, which eventually led to another book, which led to the Ingalls family. And uh, I can't really explain it, but it's been a good ride. <laughs> yes, sir? I apologize for coming late. Charles J. Biddle. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yes, sir. As an item of interest, the Sopworth Camel was uh, built by the Hawker Sidley Company. Okay. Then in World War II, with his own money, the owner of Hawker Sidley built the Hurricane. Hurricane. And he stockpiled, what, 700 of them? And without that 700 airplanes, they would have lost the Battle of Britain. Yeah, the, the, the hurricane's role, you know, it's always been the, the sort of the ugly sister kind of thing, and yet that was really the, uh, the workhorse in the early days of the war, those hurricanes. Absolutely. Yes? Does your interest extend to these old rattle trap aircraft, and do you ever... I'm, I'm sorry? Does your interest extend to the actual aircraft, and do you, uh, do you ever... Uh, I have, I have, I'm, I'm sort of fascinated by them. Uh, there are some people who are just phenomenal experts about the technology of those early aircraft. That is not me. But I've been up in a couple of these things. And as I say, when you're so used to being in a big commercial aircraft, to be in something small, and you realize and it's constantly moving. It's doing this, and it's doing this, and it, you know, it's never actually stable. Um, also, the roar of these things. You know, the United States during the war uh, developed this thing called the Liberty Engine, which eventually uh, became a 12-cylinder monster. And if you've ever heard one of these things go, especially without the muffler on it, you got superchargers and everything on. Uh, just they're, they're, they're an amazing piece of machinery, and you just close your eyes and you can see the planes flying over your head. Yeah. That Liberty Engine was a popular one with the rum runners. With rum runners, they put them in boats, they put them in speedboats, um, they, because there were so many thousands of surplus engines at the end of the war. I mean, they didn't really get the production cranked up until about the last four or five years of the war. And then the war was over. So what do you do with all these things? You sell them. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.